we are going to start this video off with a little thought experiment. I want you to imagine for a moment that you are a physicist trying to understand our universe through science and mathematics. And imagine that one day, while working on a complex theory to explain some mysterious natural phenomenon, you uncover a brutal but absolute truth. That the universe isn't real. That our lives are completely meaningless. That nothing actually matters. How would this newfound understanding affect you? Would it drive you to despair or would you reject it and hide from it despite its evident truth? Would you share it with everyone you know? Or would you destroy the evidence of your discovery to protect the world from it? Would this knowledge imprison you? Or would it set you free? Meaninglessness is the defining characteristic of the modern age. More than ever before, we suffer from an absence of purpose, a perspective-shattering global realization that nothing truly matters. We surround ourselves with the shallow, the fleeting, in order to protect our minds and egos from the futility of everything around us. We seek meaning in fandoms, in cliques and in guilds and in parties. We feed the emptiness inside of us with whatever junk will fit just to stave off the hunger pangs. And like a faraway doomsday meteor first spotted by astronomers, the arrival of this modern crisis of purposelessness, of emptiness, has been predicted by philosophers for centuries. These same prognosticating philosophers, in discussing the nature of this emptiness, often tried to offer solutions to the crisis. Some offered new ways of thinking, new perspectives that could temper the nebulous, unclear nature of the void. And yet others offered plans of action, means of self-improvement by which one could either overcome their internal feelings of meaninglessness or otherwise create one's own meaning to slot into the emptiness where meaning should go. The problem with these proposed solutions, and for that matter with these predictions, is that they come from philosophers, the single most difficult and unsociable group of people in all of history. If one tries to engage in the content of philosophy without the context of philosophy, it is easy to get lost. And yet philosophers seem almost hell-bent on making the context of philosophy as impenetrable and confusing as possible. A philosopher will tell you to your face that understanding Albert Camus' The Myth of Sisyphus requires you to have completely ingested the works of Friedrich Nietzsche, which in turn requires you to completely understand the ideas of Schopenhauer and Kierkegaard, and before you know it, you are staring at the cover of your 800-page copy of Immanuel Kant's Kritik der reinen Vernunft and wondering how your life went so wrong. It is a blessing, then that we have artists to bridge the seemingly impenetrable gap between philosophers and regular people. Indeed, with every step philosophy has taken into the impenetrable inkiness of reason, art has followed closely along, explaining it and digesting it for everyone else. And throughout history, we received this processed philosophy in the form of music and myths, of paintings and parables, of literature and liturgy. But in the present, there is an emerging art form that I think is better suited to explaining philosophy than any that has come before, and that medium is video games. And if you like thoughtful games, why not consider trying today's sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends? If you've watched my videos in the past, you know that I've got a soft spot for the occasional mobile game, and you're not going to need any other mobile game once you've got your hands on Raid Shadow Legends. With 700 plus unique champions, you will never be at a loss for choice. You'll have 15 different factions at your disposal, including but not limited to elves, dwarves, undead, and more. And with 12 imposing dungeons, heart-pounding PvP combat, and 3 exciting modes including a real-time live arena, you will certainly never be bored. Raid also features regular content updates and you can play on mobile or desktop. Customize your character and join over 400 million players in 190 plus countries. Check out the intensity of these boss battles and these awesome character designs. Listen, if a challenge is what you seek, you could try your hand at Raid's newest boss, Akumori the Phantom Shogun. Beating this undead general will allow you to upgrade your gear to ever greater heights. So get started with Raid today. You can use the link in the description or scan my QR code to get started with some fantastic bonuses, including the epic champion Drake and tons of useful boosts. Have you heard of the High Elves? Well, now you can play as them too. And if you can't get enough of Raid, you should check out their animated series, Raid Call of the Arbiter, available now on YouTube. So check that link in the description, grab your Drake and Boosts, and I will see you on Raid Shadow Legends. Video games are a very new kind of art, 
One might be compelled to strong feelings by poetry, and one might choose to interact with a beloved work of literature by producing fanfiction, but video games generally require direct interaction with the medium, which in turn produces a visceral, as opposed to abstract, understanding of the work. And this visceral understanding, this comprehension and engagement of philosophical concepts without the need for exertive reason, is an outcome that conventional artists and philosophers move heaven and earth to try and accomplish, but which video games can achieve by their very nature. And this brings me to two video games which I think are amongst the most compelling philosophical treatises on existential nihilism and the meaning of life that I have ever encountered. Toby Fox's Undertale and Deltarune. These games, though silly on their surface, encapsulate an enormous amount of philosophical substance. If one pays close attention to certain characters in each game, one can learn what Toby Fox thinks about different proposed solutions to the problem of existential nihilism, what he believes the limits of those solutions to be, and what he thinks is perhaps truly the best way to handle the void of a meaningless existence. Undertale and Deltarune are two quasi-related games produced by one Toby Fox. Toby's early works included a Halloween-themed ROM hack of the 1994 Super Nintendo game Earthbound, and music for the utterly incomprehensible 2009 webcomic Homestuck. Seriously, Homestuck makes Hegel's The Phenomenology of Spirit look like Llama Llama Red Pajama. It is astonishing then that Toby Fox went from making music for Homestuck to producing his own hit game. In 2015, Toby released a seemingly very simplistic role-playing game called Undertale. However, although the game appeared simple on the surface, the game's incredible writing and lovable characters propelled it to unimaginable heights. Undertale became something of a cultural phenomenon, selling more than one million copies in just five months. Now, if you haven't played Undertale before, let me give a quick summary of the game's plot. Long ago, two races ruled over the earth, humans and monsters. One day, a war broke out between the two races. After a long battle, the humans were victorious. The humans sealed the monsters underground with a magical barrier, but the barrier was imperfect. Many years after the war, a human child falls into the underground, and from there the game begins. You as the child make your way through the underground either slaying or befriending the monsters you encounter with the goal of escaping the underground and returning home. What makes Undertale unique, however, is that your actions in the game can directly affect the story to an astonishing degree. If you befriend every monster you meet, killing none, the ending is completely different from the ending you get if you killed even one monster along the way. And depending on if slash when you killed a certain monster, the dialogue and plot and behavior of story characters can change considerably. A few of the game's characters are even aware somehow of the game's meta-narrative. These characters include Flowey the Flower, whom we won't be discussing in great detail, Sans the Skeleton, and presumably one W.D. Gaster, short for Wingdings Gaster. All three of these awakened characters are related in a roundabout way. You see, before your character falls into the underground, the monsters were already attempting to find a way past the magical barrier, and Dr. Gaster, the royal scientist of the Monster Kingdom was ostensibly working on just such a solution. Gaster is noted as being a genius without parallel, and the creator of The Core, a sophisticated geothermal power plant that provides energy to all of monster kind. You probably won't meet Gaster in most playthroughs, though. His only in-game appearance is via a complicated easter egg, and even then it's not quite clear if this figure is actually Gaster. His entire presence and story is shrouded in mystery. The game heavily implies that Gaster was working on a lot more than just the core, that Gaster had indeed found a way past the barrier. Way, way past the barrier, as it were. In the game, so-called Gaster followers can sometimes appear in certain conditions. They appear as gray and occasionally twisted versions of other minor characters in the game. And it is through these followers that we learn a bit more about Gaster. One such a follower notes that Gaster's life was cut short when he quote-unquote fell into his creation. A different follower states that Dr. Gaster vanished without a trace, and that he was shattered across time and space. That same follower claims to be holding a piece of Gaster. Very spooky, indeed. And the final such a follower notes that though Gaster's experiments went wrong, and that his life was cut short, Gaster is actively present somehow and listening into the conversation you are having. 
The most perplexing clue concerning Gaster, however, is not even readily accessible in the game. If you use save manipulation to access the otherwise inaccessible room 264, you are treated to a black screen with shaking white text written in wingdings. When translated, it states, Entry number 17. Dark, darker, yet darker. The darkness keeps growing. The shadows cutting deeper. Photon readings negative. This next experiment seems very, very interesting. What do you two think? Although we don't know what happens to Dr. Gaster, we know that it, number one, involves darkness. Number two, involves him being shattered across time and space. And then number three, he fell into his creation. Let us go backwards then, for a moment, and return to the beginning of the video and apply that thought experiment to the character of Gaster. If you somehow found out, with absolute certainty, that existence is truly meaningless, what would you do about it? What did Gaster do? In order to understand the character of W.D. Gaster in Undertale, we must first start with an introduction to existential nihilism. Existential nihilism is a philosophical theory which states that life and existence itself is meaningless. Modern philosophers look at this idea of meaninglessness in different ways, and many propose their own solutions to that meaninglessness. Now this quandary of the human condition is by no means exclusively modern. People have been lamenting the meaninglessness of life since ancient times. Why Koholet, the son of David, wrote in the book of Ecclesiastes the following. Everything is meaningless, completely meaningless. What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth never changes. And yet, although this issue of meaninglessness is as old as human thought, it is only relatively recently that nihilism began to emerge, not as one condition amongst many, but as the prevailing and seemingly default condition of human existence. The emergence of nihilism as a distinct philosophical concept began as recently as the 18th century in, naturally, Germany. And in the traditional German fashion, the term nihilism was first dredged from obscurity as a way of criticizing opposing schools of philosophy within the greater school of thought known as German idealism. I'm going to forewarn you before we get into the weeds that German idealism is widely considered to be the single most complicated body of works in all of philosophy. If you don't understand what is going on, please don't worry. Believe me, almost nobody does, including most philosophers. In any case, on one side of German idealism, we had Immanuel Kant and Johann Gottlieb Fichte, who were interested in pushing the boundaries of philosophy as far as possible in the direction of human subjectivity. And on the other hand, we had thinkers like Friedrich Heinrich Jacobi, who was convinced that the insatiable pursuit of human subjectivity was an existential threat to Christianity, and that overemphasis on subjectivity without the moral anchor of God inevitably leads to internal meaninglessness. German idealism, you see, had one foot rooted firmly in the divine and the other foot rooted in human subjectivity. Much of Immanuel Kant's writings, for example, revolved around disproving the theretofore accepted three traditional arguments for the existence of God. The ontological argument, the cosmological argument, and the physico-theological argument. And he did this not to disprove the existence of God, but to critique pure reason. If pure reason cannot prove God's existence due to the failure of the three traditional arguments, it cannot be completely relied upon as we all know that God exists. Are you still with me? Still awake? Philosophy, am I right? The worst part is, we've only really just begun, and I can already see some of the philosophers among you shaking your head at the screen and preparing your own multi-page YouTube comment theses. Boy, just wait until we get to Hegel. In any case, Friedrich Heinrich Jacobi, in criticizing Kant and Fichte, arrived in a manner of speaking at the very problem that Friedrich Nietzsche would later become famous for postulating. If one scrutinizes everything from the lens of human subjectivity, the inevitable result is that the especially rational may end up going one step beyond Kant and removing faith entirely from the philosophical equation. Kant, you see, equated Christianity or religion with ethics, religion with morality, and religiosity with rationality. Each derives in some respect from the other. If one removes faith from the equation and dives deeper into the waters of human subjectivity, excising theism, then from what does one derive ethics or morality and thereby rationality? Well, from Kant's arguments, we arrive at Hegel, who removed the Christian anthropomorphized understanding of God from Kant's equation and replaced it with a more amorphous absolute spirit vis-a-vis -vis Baruch Spinoza. 
Ironically, all of this dissection of the understanding of God was committed in an attempt to preserve the crumbling philosophical edifice of God and Christianity from the tidal wave of personal subjectivity that was sweeping academic thought at the time. And yet the conclusion was almost, but not quite, something akin to pantheism, a notion which Hegel himself would reject. That in Kant's equation, the place where Christianity should be, the very seat of God, is encapsulated in the absolute. And what is the absolute? It is, and stay with me here, the process of self-reflection in which the whole of reality comes to understand itself through human thought. It is a singularity of rationality, the utmost state of all without remainder. It is an everything bagel. It is the infinite and universal black hole of complete truth. The conceptualization of the absolute was Hegel's great discovery, delivered to us in history's second most incomprehensible work. The most incomprehensible work, of course, being Homestuck. And not unlike Homestuck, the deeper you stare into the abyss of the absolute, the deeper the abyss begins to stare back at you. For you see, Hegel's discovery, if you can call it that, expanded the horizon of philosophy in new and absolutely terrifying ways. Human thought expanded in all kinds of new directions, and from Hegel we derived philosophers as diverse and all-encompassing as Soren Kierkegaard, Max Stirner, Ayn Rand, and Karl Marx. And it is from this zoomed-out perspective of everything, the absolute, that we begin to zoom back into the very specific, the subjective, and reject the abstract. The philosophy of Hegel falls into itself and shatters across time and space, leaving its mark on every philosopher that follows, the post-Hegelians. Hegel certainly didn't consider his work to be a discovery of meaninglessness. Hegel saw the divine in the absolute instead of the void. Hegel, one might say, opened the door to nihilism, and those he touched with the understanding of the absolute would each try to resolve the quandary of nihilism in different ways. Post-Hegelian philosophers struggled to figure out how to solve the crushing emptiness of a meaningless existence. But that which drove others to meaninglessness and emptiness, to Hegel, was merely very, very interesting. Toby Fox's Gaster is in many respects akin to Hegel. Gaster opened the door to the awareness of meaninglessness, and other characters are left behind to handle that meaninglessness in their own ways. Even if you have good intentions, if you zoom out too far, if you abstract too intensely, you risk falling into your abstractions and losing your humanity. Now it is important to note that our observations of these philosophers and Toby Fox's critiques of their solutions to nihilism must themselves be abstracted. In other words, neither myself nor Toby Fox are claiming that any of these philosophers bought completely into their solutions and went quote-unquote too far. Rather, Toby Fox's characters are an examination of these nihilism solutions taken to their logical conclusion in practice. Gaster's character, then, being sort of a mystery and not really proposing a solution to nihilism, is fitting, as Hegel himself also really wasn't trying to solve the problem of nihilism. The experiments of both Hegel and Gaster were the root of the problem itself, though neither intended their experiments to be that way. As we follow this train of thought, let us now discuss the characters that Gaster himself touched with the awareness of the void. We will begin with a character most widely presumed to be one of Gaster's assistants. Sands the Skeleton. We are never directly told in Undertale who Gaster is talking to in Entry 17. However, it is implied that these characters are one Dr. Alphys, who becomes the royal scientist after Gaster's shattering, and appears to remain completely unaware of the game's fourth wall, and Sands the Skeleton, who appears completely aware of the game's meta narrative. You might be familiar with Sans due to his mimetic popularity and because of... Sans is a friendly but intimidating presence throughout the game. He gives you tips, jokes with you, and serves as the game's hardest boss if you happen to try for the game's darkest ending. Sans somehow has meta-awareness, potentially as a result of his interactions with Gaster. Sans can tell when you've saved and loaded the game. Sans knows when you've used a save point to see what happens when you kill a character. Sans guilts you when you've done an evil act, praises you when you've done good, and threatens you when he fears you might take away a happy ending. In other words, Sans the skeleton is completely aware of the futility of his existence. He knows that in a kill everyone run, if he beats you, you can just try again and again and again, that the outcome is inevitable, and that nothing he does matters. He is awakened to that truth, but he still tries. He still tries to get to know you and to help you. He tries to convince you to stop if you're going down a dark path. 
he tries to dissuade you, even when everything seems futile. Or you see, although Sans the Skeleton is aware of the meaninglessness of his existence, instead of surrendering to nihilistic despair, or focusing on the pursuit of a meaning that can transcend the emptiness, Sans embraces the absurdity of it all. But is embracing the absurd truly the best way to handle feelings of meaninglessness? Let us look at another philosopher, a post-Hegelian philosopher who, like Sands, encourages us to reject both the emptiness of nihilism, but also the pursuit of higher meaning. Let us look at the philosophy of Albert Camus. If you somehow found out, with absolute certainty, that existence is truly meaningless, would you lie down and accept it, or would you revolt? Albert Camus was born nearly a century after Hegel. He was a French-Algerian writer, most notable for his philosophy of absurdism. Camus was a rebel by nature, and though he was a great philosophical thinker, he found the very practice of philosophizing disdainful, akin to Sisyphus of Greek myth rolling his boulder eternally up the mountain. It is human nature, he opined, to seek the meaning of existence, and we have done so since time immemorial. We ask ourselves, what is everything supposed to be for? The silence of the universe, Camus claims, is our answer. And that if life has no meaning, instead of attempting to create transcendental meaning in the ways of Hegel or Kant, or embracing despair, we must embrace the paradox. We must embrace the contradiction. We must embrace the absurd. If we humans are driven to seek meaning, and the universe replies that it is seemingly meaningless, then the solution to that feeling of meaninglessness is to revolt to take a leap of faith and face the absurdity of existence directly through living an authentic life. To take action against anguish and become what Camus calls the absurd hero. Camus says, when you escape from the prison of living for purpose, when you stop doing this or that because those are what we are supposed to do to have a purpose in life, you can live authentically. You can live in the present. You can live in the ways that make you truly happy and that are meaningful to you without having to tie that happiness to a meaning of life. You know that spending time with your family telling jokes is meaningless because your life is meaningless. But because you recognize its absurdity, you rebel against the meaninglessness and enjoy your time with your family in the present. You know that saving your family is meaningless because it is all meaningless. But because you recognize the absurdity of it all, you rebel against that meaninglessness and fight for the present anyway. To summarize, existence's fundamental lack of meaning is the absurd, and the desire to defy the absurd and to keep living in spite of it all is to revolt. Sands is very much a character in the vein of Albert Camus' absurd hero, almost to the point of parody. A nihilist, a person who has truly surrendered to the despair of meaninglessness, is without purpose or motive, save perhaps an impulse to destroy. The absurd hero, however, fights as hard as they can, not despite, but in spite of the meaninglessness of existence. As such, one could say that Camus' absurd hero is in every respect the opposite of the nihilistic villain. We see Sands, then, at his most absurd when he challenges us during a kill-everyone run of Undertale. He repeatedly stands up to our nihilistic pursuit of destruction, knowing full well that we will eventually prevail. Sans is portrayed as a lovable and heroic character in Undertale, one of the clear and obvious good guys, and yet Toby Fox offers a critique of absurdism as well through the character of Sans. Although fighting against nihilism is a worthy pursuit, handling the threat of nihilism through absurdism is fundamentally cynical. If your every action requires you to act in defiance of meaninglessness, your every action must necessarily be intentional. Sure, Sands is jokey and friendly, but if one looks closer at his character and at his interactions with the player, it becomes increasingly uncertain whether Sands is authentic in his behavior towards you and others. Sands is always smiling even when he fights you because he is a skeleton. Sands seldom shares his true feelings because he is always acting in defiance of them, in the vein of the absurd hero. Is Sans truly your friend, as he implies? Or is his friendship with you merely a very convincing means to an end? Toby is warning us that the path of the absurd hero, of the awakened but rebellious spirit, is a lonely, exhausting, and ultimately depressing one. Toby says that the active pursuit of paradoxically authentic living in spite of an acceptance of cosmic meaninglessness necessarily becomes inauthentic, 
as every action requires mindful manipulation. The fate of Sans the Skeleton is a sad one. Even in the happiest ending the game has, it is only Sans the Skeleton who remains cosmically aware that it is meaningless. And it is Sans who knows that even if you've done everything right by him in another time, you are not his friend, that even friendship is meaningless and inauthentic and useful only towards a purpose. In your attempt to usurp the absolute of Hegel, be careful that you do not lock your perspective so firmly onto the greater picture yourself that you can no longer understand the individuals therein. Do not lose sight of the individual trees as you wander the woods, for you will become lost as your mind's eye stares transfixed at the greater forest, the Mega Lovania. Deltarune is the second of Toby Fox's games, and as of this video, it only has two chapters released out of a planned seven. Now, Deltarune is a curious game. It's an anagram of Undertale, and that metaphor is fitting for the game as a whole. Deltarune has many of the same characters as Undertale, but the setting is completely different, and the stories of each game don't seem to have any relation to one another, except for one potential string. If you've already played Undertale before playing Deltarune, the whole game is suffused with this almost eerie wrongness and uncanniness. One gets the sense while playing that there are undercurrents present that the player is unaware of. One gets the feeling that they are being watched. In the beginning of Deltarune, you are spoken to by an unknown presence and tasked with creating a character. In the background, as you are making your character, Toby Fox does something quite interesting. The musical track that plays includes a specific leitmotif, the motif of W.D. Gaster, and after you've finished making your character, you are told, presumably by Gaster himself, that your wonderful creation will now be discarded. No one can choose who they are in this world. The implication here is that Gaster is somehow involved and somehow present, even in this completely different universe. Shortly after discarding your character, the game begins in earnest. You travel to school, you meet your classmates, including your old friend Noel and your bully Susie, and you fall through a magical portal in a broom closet into a dark mirror world. Therein, you meet the lovable Ralse, a dark worlder who looks suspiciously like your brother. And Ralse tells you that there is something called a dark fountain, which threatens to upset the balance between light and dark, potentially destroying the world that you came from. Your quest is then to close the fountain and return home. Along the way, though, if you play the game in just the right way, you can potentially meet Deltarune Chapter 1's secret boss, Jevil. Jevil is a strange, delusional clown-like creature of immense power. The game hints, but does not outright state, that Jevil received some revelation from Gaster, awakening him to the meaninglessness of existence. He is imprisoned in isolation underneath the castle, where the Dark Fountain is located, but he states that in truth, it is he alone who is free, and that everyone else is imprisoned. If you choose to fight him, he declares a few different times that he can do anything, and that seems to be true. He can break the rules of the game. For example, his character is voiced, which is not the case for any other character in the entire game. His attacks and references are fourth wall breaking. His psyche is completely unhinged from reality. If you somehow found out with absolute certainty that existence is truly meaningless, would the truth imprison you? or would it set you free? After all, if nothing matters, if nothing has consequence, then you could do anything. I could do anything. Jean-Paul Charles Aymard Sartre was a French philosopher and a contemporary of Albert Camus. And although they initially shared a similar approach to the problems of nihilism, their philosophies began to diverge as they developed, such that in the end, the two thinkers were all but directly opposed to each other. Not unlike Camus, Sartre rejected the idea of nihilistic resignation and asserted that human beings have the power to create their own meaning and values. And also like Camus, Sartre proposes that the solution to the predicament of existential nihilism is in rejecting societal expectations and seeking authenticity. However, where Camus and Sartre diverge is in how one seeks authenticity. For Camus, authenticity is derived from rebellion against the meaninglessness, when you recognize that nothing has meaning, that you are not free but enslaved, and yet you choose to rebel and persist in life, you are generating an authentic experience through rebellion. 
Make no mistake, says Kamu, you are like Sisyphus pushing the boulder up the mountain forever and ever, never free from the meaninglessness of life. But if Sisyphus can manage to push the boulder in defiance, acknowledging the absurdity of action in the face of futility, Camus says, one must imagine Sisyphus happy. Sartre, however, derives authenticity from personal freedom. Even if life is meaningless, says Sartre, as long as we exist and are able to define ourselves from our conscious choices and actions, we can live authentically and create our own meaning by making choices that resonate with our core values. In other words, our freedom as individuals, the freedom to have our own unique core values, and the freedom to make choices that further those values is what gives us our purpose and meaning. To live an authentic life means to reject societal expectations and to embrace a different responsibility. Not to society, but to your own freedom to choose, and thereby your own power to make meaning. If one lives inauthentically, by conforming to societal norms or adopting predefined roles, or denying their own freedom even in physical captivity, one succumbs to what Sartre calls bad faith, and one relinquishes their agency, thereby evading, without confronting, the existential challenges inherent in their existence. Jeffel is hardly as friendly or engaging a character as, say, Sans the Skeleton. When we encounter Jeffel, he appears insane to us, a literal mad clown imprisoned in a dungeon. He makes no attempt to burst out of his prison once you've opened the door. Instead, he invites you joyfully, almost desperately, into his world. He is as jovial as he is violent, aware of greater truths, yet utterly incomprehensible. Toby Fox tells us through Jebel that there is some value in pursuing the responsibility of individual freedom as a means to overcome the meaninglessness of existence. Even in terrible situations of imprisonment, of desperation, of insanity, one can still live meaningfully, one can still live authentically, and one can still overcome despair if one does not relinquish their agency. If you choose to be free, you are free. But in the character of Jevil, Toby also offers a warning. Where Sands as the absurd hero is stuck forever looking at the forest, Jevil is forever stuck staring at a single tree, his own. For if you build a new meaning of life out of freedom that derives from your core values and nobody else's, no societal expectations, no so-called bad faith, then you and you only are free, and everyone else is imprisoned. Sartre's solution to this conundrum is what he calls intersubjectivity, or the role of the other. Authentic living, Sartre says, requires one to recognize the freedom and subjectivity not only of oneself, but others. The other is not an object to be observed or manipulated, but is a fundamentally individual subject of its own right and freedoms. We are supposed to use the other as a mirror to challenge our own self-centeredness as we consider the perspectives and interests of others. The other can be both validating and threatening to the self and thereby to one's meaningfulness. We are supposed to navigate between projecting our autonomy, our freedom, while acknowledging the autonomy or freedom of others, which Sartre says is the basis of ethics in a meaningless world. But therein lies another problem. If you are to build your moral framework pursuant to your individual freedom, what happens when every other you encounter hasn't yet become free? Their mirror is not a reflection of themselves, it reflects society. It shows the very bad faith you are trying to avoid. But what happens is that you sink deeper into yourself, into your personal freedoms, into your meaning of life, until you alone are free and everyone else is imprisoned. You desperately seek to share your personal freedoms, to free others, only to find that your perspective is so alien to others that it resembles insanity, that it drives others not to liberty, but to darkness. After you defeat Jevil and close the dark fountain in the dark world, you return to the light world. Your once bully Susie is now your close friend, and the two of you make plans to return to the dark world the next day. The next day comes, and this time you find yourselves entering a dark portal in the library's computer lab, emerging into a cyber world ruled by a meme queen. In the process, two of your acquaintances, your childhood best friend Noelle and your weird rival Birdly, are kidnapped, and you, Susie, and Ralph say go on an adventure to rescue them from the heart of the cyber world. Along the way, in a dingy city alley, 
you encounter a funny little man living in a dumpster. He introduces himself as Spamton, and it is immediately apparent that something is very, very wrong with Spamton. He twitches erratically, and his words are periodically replaced by strange bracketed phrases. Spamton appears to be barely in control of himself. He is a caricature of a sleazy salesman mixed with something more sinister. You fight him during your first meeting, and he encourages you after the fight to meet him alone at his shop in the dump. You then have the option of continuing with Spamton's story or ignoring it completely. If you decide to assist Spamton, you get to learn a little bit more about his backstory. Spamton is a species of Dark Worlder known as an Addison, an anthropomorphized internet advertisement. Spamton struggled greatly in his work and was never successful, and yet despite his lack of success, he would always tell his fellow Addisons that one day he would become a big shot. As Spamton continued to fail though, he became increasingly desperate for success. One day, Spamton got in contact with a mysterious someone on the phone, and with this mysterious presence's help, Spamton became immensely successful. The other Addisons noted that Spamton was often seen on the phone conversing with this unknown presence, and as Spamton became more successful, the other Addisons spent less time with him, jealous as they were of his success. Spamton's prestige soared to incredible heights. He had his own room at the Queen's Mansion, and he had deals of increasing value from TV commercials to car sales. Spamton was a big shot at last. Until very suddenly, he wasn't. The mysterious presence guiding Spamton vanished one day, and all of Spamton's success disappeared with him. And with all of his success gone, Spamton was thrown out of the Queen's Mansion. When we find Spamton in his shop in the dump, he asks us to bring a digitized version of himself to the underground of the Queen's Mansion, where he puts into action one final plan to be a big shot. Spamton ascends to his final form, Spamton Neo, but he is horrified to discover that his great, powerful new form comes with strings attached. Of all the existentialist philosophers we've discussed so far, Camus, Sartre, and arguably Hegel, the one philosopher you, the viewer, are most likely to be familiar with is Friedrich Nietzsche. It is Nietzsche's work that the general public most closely associates with the idea of nihilism. You may recall Nietzsche's famous quote, God is dead, referencing not the literal death of God, but the loss of meaningfulness that European society derived from Christianity, the result of which is nihilism. And yet, as you may also recall from earlier in this video, Nietzsche really wasn't the first person to see this coming either. Hegel, as we had mentioned, spoke about this at length, and though we did not discuss them, so did Arthur Schopenhauer and Max Stirner. Nietzsche, however, was an especially vocal critic of nihilism, and he sought, perhaps more than any other philosopher, to warn about the impending zeitgeist of nihilism to come. In his critiques, Nietzsche postulates that two forms of nihilism exist, passive nihilism and active nihilism. Passive nihilism is a state of resignation and surrender to the meaningless. We see passive nihilism in the character of Sham from Deltarune Chapter 1, the court wizard who is partially awakened to the meaninglessness of existence by Jevil, but who responded to this knowledge with disillusionment and surrender as opposed to action against the void. Active nihilism, on the other hand, is the way Nietzsche envisions overcoming meaninglessness. The active nihilist experiences that same existential dread and futility that the passive nihilist experiences, but instead of succumbing to despair, the active nihilist consciously destroys all of the meaningfulness in their lives, such that a blank state is created. In so doing, one becomes a free spirit, what Nietzsche calls a little tabula rasa of consciousness, so that there is again space for new things. And what does one do with this tabula rasa of consciousness? this empty vessel. Nietzsche's proposed solution is called the will to power. The will to power is the inherent drive in all living things to exert their influence and strive for growth in self-affirmation or self-value. Nietzsche says that the underlying force of life is to expand, to overcome obstacles, to survive, and to exert control over one's environment. But merely tapping into the will to power is insufficient to solve the problem of nihilism. The will to power complements what Nietzsche calls the affirmation of life. If one is to defeat cosmic meaninglessness, one must embrace the totality of the experiences of life, including both joy and suffering. By confronting and engaging with these experiences, including and perhaps especially suffering, one is able to truly commit 
to the will to power. After all, it is only by recognizing and engaging with your suffering that you can hope to power through it and become more powerful. The conquest of struggles and suffering through the will to power is what Nietzsche calls self-overcoming. If one constantly seeks to surpass their limitations, embrace their suffering, and cultivate their strengths to their fullest potential, one can then overcome themselves to live into their fullest experience, into their fullest existence. A state of being that Nietzsche calls the Übermensch, or in English, the Superman. The Übermensch is a person who has transcended conventional morality by fully embracing the will to power. They have conquered themselves and are capable of self-overcoming. The Übermensch is meant to be the pinnacle of human potential. By pursuing greatness, and by realizing one's own power, the individual can rise above the limitations of nihilism, and inspire others to do the same. In short, one can become a big shot. Spamton is a unique character even amongst Toby Fox's villains, in that Spamton is the only character who truly cares only about himself. The other enemies in the game are all purposefully shown to be empathetic. It can be argued that the entire point of Undertale is to show how there are no real bad guys, only the hurt, the misunderstood, and the trouble. If you are familiar with Undertale, you might know that the initially evil Flowey the Flower can be reformed. Asgore, the king of the monsters, is a gentle-hearted ruler who has made terrible decisions for the sake of his people, which he now regrets. And even Kara, who is arguably the most nihilistic character in the series, doesn't really care about himself. He is like Nietzsche's active nihilist, unenlightened by the affirmation of life in that he seeks destruction congruous with the meaninglessness of existence as he understands it to be. Spamton, however, is aware of the meaninglessness of existence, informed of it, perhaps by Gaster. But Spamton seeks to overcome the emptiness by self-overcoming, by embracing the will to power. He desires more than anything else to become influential, to become successful. He embraces the misery of it all, the humiliation, the indignity, and stops at nothing to achieve his goal of becoming a big shot. If one is lost in despair, if one is lost in the void of a meaningless existence, going to the gym, building one's career, working on one's skills, these are all great uses of one's time, all great ways to find meaning. However, pursuit of productivity, or material wealth, or power, for the sake of self-overcoming, is an inherently selfish activity. And Toby Fox warns us that it is very easy to trip over the threshold, to turn the desire to improve oneself into a mindless quest for vanity that if one tries to fill the emptiness inside with accomplishments and success and wealth and power, one might become the Übermensch, yes, but that becoming the Übermensch comes with strings attached. The Übermensch is a slave to his own vanity, is a slave to society's expectations of him, is a slave to his ego, and if the will to power is pushed to its utmost, the Übermensch is a friend only to himself. There is never an Uber that is Uber enough. One can self-overcome, but there will always be another self thereafter, and the process can never truly cease. The purest pursuit of Übermensch, the fullest realization of the will to power, leads ultimately to vainglorious self-destruction. And once you have crossed a certain threshold in the pursuit of power, of success, of wealth, and of the self, there is no coming back. When the final string is cut, what remains is not the Übermensch. What remains is you. You and your emptiness. The concept of home and what that means has a long philosophical history. Philosophers such as Gaston Bachelard, David Morris, Edward Casey, Emmanuel Levinas, and most notably perhaps Martin Heidegger, have all discussed the phenomenology of space and the significance of the home. Bachelard once described the home as the topography of our intimate being, and Heidegger argued that human existence and meaningfulness is intimately tied to the idea of the dwelling. That dwelling is more than just a physical space. The concept of home is the way in which we relate to the world and find a sense of belonging. Home is where we can actually and authentically be ourselves, away from judging eyes and in the company of those who see us as we truly are. But wait, what if we dig a layer deeper? Aren't relationships and family and loved ones and friends, aren't these all just obfuscations as well? Aren't these immaterial things just a candy coating around the hard material truth of meaninglessness? Maybe, 
maybe. But consider for a moment what meaningfulness is, what purpose is. Why do we so desperately want existence to be meaningful? Why do we despair if we believe that life might be meaningless? What is meaning? What is purpose? In this single question, what is meaningfulness? Heidegger and Camus and Sartre and Nietzsche and even Hegel touch upon meaningfulness as being some engagement or realization or pursuit of authenticity. And it is here where I think that Toby Fox offers his own ideas on meaningfulness. If you desire to live authentically, if you seek meaning, Toby says, perhaps what you truly seek is belonging. After all, who cares about what the universe says or does if you have some place to be? Nihilism is extremely alienating because it removes a person from a sense of belonging to the universe. Everything seems wrong. I don't belong here. I don't belong. To which Toby says, if you don't belong somewhere, then go home. In both Undertale and Deltarune, Toby gives us moments of respite from philosophizing and adventuring. Little glimpses of love and belonging, opportunities to go home. In Deltarune, for example, at the end of each chapter, one goes back to the comforting and familiar presence of town. We see familiar faces and old friends and there's nobody to fight. It is only when the dark world intrudes upon the familiar, when nihilism strikes at belonging, that we must close the dark fountain for fear that the dark might overtake the light. And we see too how home can mean very different things for different people. We, the players, find the town and our character Chris's house comforting and like home. But we get hints that Chris doesn't feel at home in those places, that Chris feels more at home in the company of Susie and arguably Ralsei exploring the dark world. Home for one person is not necessarily home for another. And in the beginning of Undertale, not long after our character falls into the underground, we are spirited away from the violence of Flowey the Evil Flower by Toriel, a motherly goat monster, the former queen of monsters who takes us in and encourages us not to venture further. She treats us like her own child, and for just a moment in the game, a fleeting moment, there is a sense of peace, of belonging. For the sake of the game's narrative, we are encouraged to push past this respite. We are pushed to seek something greater, something more. And if you play the game all the way to its true pacifist, semi-secret ending, that is exactly what you get. The catharsis of a job well done, of everything being as it should be. But that is after you've seen everything that has come before. That is after you know that you could restart the game at any time and that Sans would be aware, and that all the good you've done would be for naught. That is before you realize that in tens of millions of save files all throughout the world, some Undertale universes never had happy endings or any endings. Some Undertales were abandoned, other Undertales were deleted, and yet some Undertales met a gruesome, desolate end. Undertale and increasingly Deltarune is a game full of many choices. The choice to hurt or to empathize, the choice to save or to destroy, the choice to befriend or to be foul. And yet there is an unspoken choice that you can make right at the beginning of Undertale, one that the game doesn't even have a quirky dialogue option or unique state of play for. You can choose to stay with Toriel in that house and just shut the game off, never being any the wiser. Toby Fox says yes, you can try to resolve the emptiness inside by embracing the absurdity of it all. Yes, you can try to escape the meaninglessness of it all by sinking deep into your personal freedom. Yes, you can try to overcome the void by becoming the most powerful version of yourself. And yes, you can try to transcend nihilism by attuning to the absolute. But you could also go home. You could go back to the familiar, back to the innocent and simple. You can go back to where you belong. Now I understand that many of you may have never experienced this feeling of home that I am speaking of, perhaps outside of Deltarune or Undertale. That glimpse of belonging, of acceptance, of warmth, and purpose, and meaningfulness without condition. Some of you may even be persecuted for who you are, for your race, or your religion, or your nationality, or your identity. Home, though, is not necessarily a particular physical location, nor is it necessarily a group of people. Home is where you belong. And whether you already have a home in your heart or you choose to build a home around you out of the people or animal friends you love, or you choose to find a home with others to belong to, home is out there. Home could be where your family is or where your cats are. It could be the drama club at school or the pub on a weekend. It could be with your stuffed animals. And it could even be, in defiance of Hegel and Kant, the church. 
and where there is home, says Toby Fox, perhaps there too is the meaning of life. Maybe it doesn't have to be any more complicated than that. The distance and coldness of modern existence contributes substantially to the power of nihilism over our lives. Nothing feels authentic because nothing is authentic. We are constantly being marketed to, constantly being deceived, being told that we are not good enough and being sold places to belong. We are told what we should be by machine men with machine minds and machine hearts. We may live in houses, but we are denied the comfort of home. If you struggle to find a home, a place to belong, and thereby a reason to live, maybe this is a good time to think about building that home around you, finding like minds, meditating or praying, perhaps, maybe adopting a cat or a friend group or a stuffed shark, depending on your circumstances. And if you are in a situation where the place that should be home is filled with suffering instead of belonging, or if you are being denied a home by matters outside of your control, keep in mind, even in that darkness, there is a light inside your soul. The place where you belong is out there. Home is waiting for you. Which reminds me, I have a little gift for you. My dear friend Dawn, a professional baker who works at Boutique Resorts, has provided me with her personal recipe for homemade butterscotch cinnamon pie to share with all of you. Please give it a try and enjoy. There's a link to the recipe in the description. It's the only additional reading that I'm providing for this video. And please don't forget to check out my link to Raid Shadow Legends or scan the QR code. You'll get incredible bonuses and an exciting epic champion. Our sponsors are a big help to Moon Channel. So thank you for giving Raid a try. I've been your host, Mooney, and thank you for tuning in to Moon Channel. Don't forget, I'm with you in the dark.